I've been on a quest trying to build the perfect game server. One that lets me host games like Minecraft, Valheim, Counter-Strike, Team Fortress 2, Terraria, and more. I wanted one with a management panel that allows me to quickly spin up new game servers and tear them down. One that I could use to see logs and quickly issue commands. And also, one that's user-friendly, secure, can scale, and while we're at it, throw in free and open source and make it Docker to the core. And that's when I found Pterodactyl. Pterodactyl is a free and open source game management panel that is built on a modern stack. It's designed with security in mind and runs all games and servers isolated in Docker containers. It has a user-friendly UI that lets you quickly create game servers, monitor their status, issue commands, add users, edit and modify game server files, and much, much more. It supports games like Minecraft, Rust, Terraria, Team Fortress 2, Counter-Strike, Gary's Mod, Ark, Factorio, Grand Theft Auto, Risk of Rain 2, Satisfactory, Space Engineers, and many, many others. And with all of this functionality comes a little bit of complexity, but there's some terms we'll have to talk about. Pterodactyl is made up of a few parts. First, we have a Pterodactyl server, which is actually a game panel. This is where you configure your server and your games. Next, we have wings. Wings are really the control plane for all of your nodes and nodes are just servers. So each of the servers run the Wings agent, and this is how games are deployed to your server nodes. I say server nodes because you can actually have more than one. Each node that has the Wings agent installed on it can have game servers deployed to it. We're gonna stick with one node, but it's easy to expand later. Next, going down this turn tree, we have nests. Yes, play along with this metaphor for a minute. Nests are really a collection of individual games. For most games, you will have one nest, but multiple games can belong to a nest. Games are called eggs. <laughs> yes, eggs. Eggs are a combination of a game and configuration. And like I said, you can have multiple in one nest. Take for instance, Minecraft. You may have a nest called Minecraft, but multiple eggs like bedrock, paper, vanilla, or other variations of the game. Okay, here's one more bird metaphor and then we're done. It's yolks. Seriously, yolks. <laughs> Yolks are a pre-built Docker image that work with eggs. These are the images that will run inside of our nodes. So to recap, Pterodactyl is a panel that you can add one or more nodes that run the Wings agent and works with Docker to create game servers, of which are part of a nest that includes one or more eggs. And that egg container image is a yolk. Hopefully you got all that because there will be a pop quiz at the end. This has traditionally been challenging. However, over the last week, I've put all of this together using Docker and would love to share it with you. So today, we're gonna set up Pterodactyl panel using Docker. We're going to get the panel up and running with a MariaDB database, a Redis database for caching, and working with a reverse proxy so we can do all of this securely. We're then going to set up and configure Docker Wings agent on our nodes so we can deploy game servers to it. Then, we're gonna set up and configure games like Minecraft, Counter-Strike, Terraria, Team Fortress 2, and even Valheim, which gives you a great start to the perfect gaming server. So what do we need to get started? We need two servers, both that can run Docker, one for our panel and one to run all of our game servers. If you're running containers already somewhere else like Portainer or even Kubernetes, that will work great for your panel. So all you need is another server to run your games. We'll need to remote into our first server, the one that's gonna run the panel. Once we're in here, we'll wanna create a folder for Pterodactyl. And then once we're in here, I'm gonna create a folder called Panel. And then in this folder, we're gonna create a Docker Compose file. And in that Docker Compose file goes this file right here. So this is our Docker Compose for the Panel service. As you can see, this stack does quite a bit. A lot of this are the default settings and some of it is tweaking that I had to do to get this to work. But I did mention that we'll need two databases, one MariaDB and another Redis for caching. And this stack includes that, so you don't need to worry about that. But if you have those databases somewhere else, you can supply credentials for them. But if we look at the stack, we're just doing some configuration here. We're setting up our database passwords and credentials. We're setting up some additional environment settings here. This app URL here, you wanna make sure it points to the app URL when this is hosted. So I mentioned we're gonna put this behind a reverse proxy. It's kind of important. You don't have to, but I highly recommend doing it. Need help setting up a reverse proxy? I've got a couple of guides on them, so check those out. But this is going to be the HTTPS endpoint that this is hosted on. This is only hosted internally. You can see it's gameserver.local.tektronic.us. 
Then you'll want to make sure you set the time zone, and this is the time zone of the server. If you're using UTC, you can put UTC, or if you're using a time zone based on location, you can set that. Then we'll set an email for the app service author. This isn't too important right now, but what is really important is this trusted proxy. This took me a while to figure out. So if you're putting this behind a reverse proxy, you'll want to make sure that you set your trusted proxy. Now this will be the IP address of your reverse proxy. If you're having troubles like I did in the beginning, you can say that all proxies are trusted, as you can see I did with the star, it's a wildcard. But I would highly recommend replacing this star with the IP address of your reverse proxy. If not, you'll have a lot of problems like I did. Next, you can set up mail. I didn't set this up, but this is nice and handy so that if someone that's using your panel needs to reset their password, it will email them a reset link. I'm the only one using this panel, so I'm not gonna configure it, but nice to know it's there. Next below, you'll see some more configuration for our services. As I mentioned, we're gonna set up MariaDB. We're gonna map some volumes to where that data lives. We're gonna set up some username and passwords. You should probably change this. We're gonna use this for now, but this is going to create a database with the user Pterodactyl, and it's gonna use our password from above. Then it's gonna set up a Redis database. So Redis is a in-memory database, key value pair. It's used for mainly for caching, but a lot of other things. Uh, super high performance and Pterodactyl uses this. Next, we're gonna expose some ports. So we're only gonna expose 80 and 443. Technically, I think we only need to do 443, but we're gonna expose them both. Then we're linking both our database and our cache, setting up some volumes, and then setting up some more configuration for our database and our environment, and then setting up a network for these to communicate on. So you'll wanna tweak these to your liking, but I would highly recommend just copying and pasting mine from the documentation, and you can find that in the description below. So let's paste this in our Docker Compose and save it. Then let's spin this up using docker-compose up-d-force-recreate. And if you're having problems with docker-compose, I think in the latest version, they've split them out to say docker space compose. Uh, but if you're using an older version and upgraded, I think they created an alias for you. Anyways, let's spin this up. So it created our database, our MariaDB database. Then it created our cache, our Redis cache, and then it created the panel. So now we should be able to go out and see our panel. And now if you go out to the Pterodactyl panel, we have a sign in. Awesome. So what's our username and password? No clue, because we didn't set one. So in order to set one, we actually need to go back to our server and we need to run a command. It's this docker-compose run dash dash rm panel php artisan and then p user and then mac or make. So this will actually exec into that pod and initiate a command so we can create a user. So let's do that. First question, is it an administrator? Yes. Then we'll enter our email address. Then we'll enter our username. Then we'll enter a password. Now we should be able to log into the panel. And we got signed in. This is our dashboard. We don't have any servers yet, so we need to create some, but let's check out the settings first. If we go into settings, we can see an overview of all of the settings. You can see things like obviously settings, application API, if you wanna use their API, database, location, nodes, which we'll set up here in a little bit, servers, users, mounts, and nests. So the first thing we wanna do is actually set up one of our nodes or one of our servers, not our game server, but a node or a virtual machine or a physical machine that will end up running our game servers. So let's start that process first. First, you think you go into nodes, but as soon as you try to create one, it says we need to create a location first. So let's create a location. So a location can be a physical location, a virtual location, or really anything to help group your servers together. I'm just gonna call this one home. Once we create our location, then we can create a node. So to create our node, the first thing we wanna do is give it a name. Now I'm just gonna give mine the same name of the node, the fully qualified domain name, which brings us back to our fully qualified domain name. So here, I'm gonna set the same thing here. And so this is where it gets a little bit complicated and where I went off in the weeds earlier this week. And so we wanna communicate over SSL for obvious reasons. And if your panel's running SSL, your nodes will also need to be running SSL for the agent for that endpoint. It's a little bit tricky here but you'll want to choose use SSL connection, obviously. And then you'll want to say you're behind a proxy. You'll need to choose that this is behind a proxy. Otherwise, when the Wings agent starts up, it'll try to look for some certificates that it generated that aren't going to be there. So basically telling it it's behind a proxy says, hey, we're going to supply certificates for you, but still use SSL. That's the way I understand it. So make sure you choose behind a proxy. And if you're doing this without certificates, just to test it out, 
you would set these both to use HTTP and you're not using a proxy. Anyways, took a while for me to figure that out. Next, we'll need to set the total memory for this node and this is how much memory the node can use. I'm gonna say mine can use 10 gigs and I'm gonna say the memory over allocation is zero. Next is how much disk space this node will use. I'm setting mine to 100 gigs. Now that seems like a lot, but some games that we're gonna install can be really big. So this is really gonna be up to you. I would go higher and give this machine more disk space than you ever think you're gonna use because some game servers are really big. And I'm gonna do the same thing. The disk over allocation is zero. And the daemon port, this is where I got tripped up quite a bit, quite a bit. So traditionally you would set the daemon port to 8080, but I found that this combination of using SSL, saying I'm behind a proxy, using my own reverse proxy, I need to set the daemon port to 443. Sounds kind of weird, but I actually do need to do it. I mean, it makes sense if you're saying HTTPS, but I thought I could map it in my reverse proxy to 443 and then have it switch and use a port of 8080, but we actually have to use this port in the weak's agent that you'll see here in a second. Anyways, if you're doing this behind a reverse proxy, like I am, I would highly recommend using 443. Otherwise, you're gonna go crazy. Okay, so now we can create this node, but before we do, we actually need to install the agent on that node, the wings agent. Wings agent. Ah. So this is going to be on our second server now. And I promise it gets a lot easier after this. This is the hardest part of this whole entire setup. And I probably spent a good five, six hours trying to figure this out. So we'll want to remote into the server where our games will be running. Remember the one that's running the wings agent. And we'll want to make a folder called pterodactyl. And then we'll CD into that directory. And then we'll make a directory called wings. And then we'll CD into that directory. And you should see, we don't have anything in here. So what's gonna go in here? Well, a Docker Compose file. So what's gonna go in that Docker Compose file? Our Wings agent. So this is our Wings agent, and this is what we'll be pasting into that Docker Compose file. This one's a lot smaller than the other one, but really what it is is an agent that exposes some ports that allows communication between the server and the node to deploy games to it. And so pretty high level, what we're doing is exposing some ports, setting some environment variables, setting a username, that's the same one that should match on the server panel, mapping some volumes and setting up some networks. Okay, so let's copy this file and let's paste it into here. Let's close out of there. Then let's bring our agent up. And if we check our Docker logs, we see some errors, but this is kind of normal because we didn't add a configuration file, which is a good segue into creating our configuration file here in a second. So let's go back into the server now. And we have this form partially filled out. Let's make sure everything's good. Name, public, name, use SSL, behind a proxy, memory set, disk space set, and our ports are set. So now let's create a node. So it doesn't look like anything's happening. So let's go to nodes and we can see here that our node is listed, but we can see this heart. Not sure why it's a heart, but this is not a good sign. You should see a green heart, not a red heart. So it can't connect to our node because we need to create a configuration for it. So let's drill into this node. Let's go into configuration and here's our configuration for this node to be able to connect to our server. So we should see some hints of what we configured. We can see here that our host is gonna be localhost or all IPs on this machine, but we're saying the port is 443 and we see that SSL enabled is false. This is what I was talking about earlier. We don't wanna supply our own certificates because we're behind a reverse proxy. And then we're seeing some additional ports, so SFTP, so it can transfer data to the server, and then allowed mounts, we don't need to worry about that. And then remote, so this is where our server panel is. This should be pointing to your server panel, and it should be HTTPS. So let's copy this configuration, and it says it needs to go into etsy slash pterodactyl in a file called config.yaml. So let's go back to our server and do that. So let's cd into etsy pterodactyl, Let's see a pterodactyl do an ls. We don't see a config here. So I actually need to do a sudo nano config.yml or yaml. Let's paste the contents in here. Save this, exit. Then let's recreate this container. And after it's recreated, let's do a docker logs for this container. And now we actually see a good sign. So some good logs. So let's go back to our server panel now. If we go into nodes, we now have a green heart. So this is a good sign. If you make, I shouldn't say if, when you make it to this point, this means you're at a good point. 
If you don't see a green heart, I wouldn't do anything else until you make this heart green. It's kind of confusing, but take it slow and make sure you have everything filled out properly. And if you're behind a reverse proxy, make sure that those DNS entries are actually served out through HTTPS. So this is a good sign. Let's go into our node now. So now it can communicate with this node. Again, a good sign. Next thing we need to do is assign allocations. I had no idea what this was until I started using this. But basically we need to set aside a block of ports that we can use on the server to run our game servers. And we need to assign those to an IP address. So what we need to do here is put the IP address of this node. <laughs> It's actually hard to figure out what IP address you need. I mean, after I got it working and I explained it the way I just did, it makes sense. But everyone says, put in the IP address of your server. And in my head, I think the panel's the server. No, you put in the IP address of this node that we're going to configure. And for ports, you're gonna wanna use a block of ports for your servers. Now, most game servers are gonna have one, two, three, four, five ports. And then you multiply that by all of your games. You can go as far and as wide as you want. So I typically pick 27,000 to 27,099. So that gives me 100 ports. So I'm saying, hey, this server is gonna host games on ports 27,000 to 27,099. And if you need more ports than that, feel free to add more. And you wanna pick ports that are in a higher ranged ones that aren't typically used. But since this node isn't doing anything besides running our games and running this wings agent, we shouldn't have any conflict with any ports. So it's a safe bet, 27,000 to 27,099. And we'll submit this. And then once we submit this, we can see, okay, now this IP address you see right here, this IP address, which is this node, has assigned a port of 27,000 and it has a port of 27,001. And this becomes important here in a little bit when we start our servers, which is a great segue into configuring our first game server. Everything we did up until now was, was pretty challenging. Everything else is super fun. <laughs> so let's get into that. Let's create our first server. So we want to create a game server. What game server do we want to create? So if we go down here to our nest configuration, you can see our nest is Minecraft. This is what I was talking about earlier. You have a nest and you have eggs. So the nest is Minecraft, an umbrella of Minecraft, and under that are different flavors of Minecraft. Let's pick vanilla Minecraft and say that this server is going to be Minecraft. So let's scroll back up and name this. I'm gonna name this Minecraft vanilla. The server owner, you'll always need to assign this. I forget to pick myself every time, but assign the server to someone. Then you're gonna allocate this to a server. This is why we created allocations. So we have our game server node right here. It's already selected. And then we have allocations. These are the ports we're gonna assign them to. And you can see I have 100 ports to choose from. I'm gonna choose the first one, makes it a little bit easier. You can assign additional allocations if for some reason this server needs additional ports, but we don't need that for Minecraft. Next are database limits, allocation limits, backup limits. I don't have any of that set, so I'm not gonna to touch any of that. Now we have some resource management for this container. Really, I'm gonna set up only a couple of things. I'm gonna say that this Minecraft server can use up to a gig of RAM, zero swap, and then I'm going to actually say it can use 2048, two gigs of disk space. Now, like I mentioned earlier, some servers are going to use a lot more disk space and some are gonna use a lot less. You can configure this now. If you see that your server won't start because it's out of disk space, just bump this up a little bit restart it and it should run fine. But now that we have that going, I should be able to say create server. And if we go into this tab right here, this pop out, we actually can see our server is starting up. So the server starting up, I didn't pick the Java image. You should most likely pick the latest version of Java for this. So let's click update Docker image to the latest Java. It's nice it prompted me. Should have picked it to begin with because I think it was on Java 6. Next, it's gonna ask you for the EULA for Minecraft. You know, this is typically hard. I think you'd have to create some text file or set some environment variables. They're asking you right here, which is super nice. Say accept, pulling those images down, starting our Minecraft server. Now it's preparing our world. And you can see we get some stats down here, the memory usage, some CPU usage, that's nice. We could see over here, RAM, disk space, super nice. If you don't see these charts down here, there's a quick fix. You need to add a line to your grub entry. 
um, and then update your grub. I'll have that in the documentation just in case. It took me another 45 minutes to hunt down and figure out. So I'll have that in the documentation if you don't see this, but most likely you should. All right, our server is now running. Awesome. Well, it was running and then it finished everything and then it now prompted the Java update. So it's gonna run that really quick. Pick the latest version of Java if you do this and you won't run into that. But this should go fairly quick because I think everything was already cached. So it did crash once and I think it's because I didn't give it enough RAM. So let's actually kill this and do this really quick. I can show you how that works. Go back to our server settings, go back to our servers, choose Minecraft, go into our build configuration. Let's give it two gigs of RAM. Let's update that. And while we're at it, let's change our Docker configuration to say it's 17 to begin with, save modifications. Then let's pop back out. Let's start it back up. Now we can see we have two gigs of RAM and it started with open JDK 17. So off to a good start. Should have did that from the beginning. Okay, now the server is running and it's green. So let's connect to it. So let's launch the client, say play. Now we have the client running, let's say multiplayer. Let's edit the server because I already tested one. And what's our IP address? It's right up here. It's being served out through 192.168.30.33 and it's on port 27,000. So let's say done. And let's try to connect. We look at the logs. We could say, hey, Techno Tim logged in and joined. So now I'm actually on this server that we're self-hosting. Awesome, so there's Minecraft, easy enough. Now let's choose a different server. Let's disconnect, we can see we're disconnected. And now let's create a new server. Go into servers and let's create a new one. And let's go down and see what else is available. So it looks like we only have a few servers here, but actually we have more because these are more like engines or nests, if you will. But under source engine, we can see that we have a lot of eggs because these are all based on the same type of server. So we can spin up Arc, Counter-Strike, Gary's Mod, Insurgency, or Team Fortress 2. So let's, what should we do? Team Fortress 2 or, or Counter-Strike? Let's go Team Fortress 2. Uh, probably not a popular opinion, but let's do that. So let's say it's TF2, server owner is gonna be me. And here we go again with allocations. That node, the only node I have, and a new IP address, 27,001. So that's enough for there. Memory, I'm gonna give this more memory. I'm gonna give this four gigs. And disk space, this actually needs quite a bit of disk space. So I found this needs around 12 or 13 gigs of disk space. I'm gonna give it that number because I found that works. That's kind of the minimum, but it needs a lot of disk space for it. Then we'll see some additional settings down here. The game ID, we don't need to change this. And the default map, we can change this if we want. So we should be able to create a server now. And if we go into servers now, and we can see Team Fortress 2, we'll pop out to the console, and we can see this is downloading and extracting. So this is gonna take some time, and this is actually pretty cool because it uses Steam CMD to download the game anonymously from Steam, pull it down, extract it, and start your server. So while that's going, let's start up another one. So what do we do if we need to add a custom game? As we saw, we can create new servers and we can see here that we have a limited amount of games. Don't get me wrong, it's a decent amount, but what happens if we wanna add more? Well, the community has built tons of nests with tons of games and it's actually really cool. So if we go out to this GitHub repo, Parker VCP slash eggs, we'll find a lot of eggs. And in here, we can see different eggs for games. So if we go into game eggs, we can see we have a lot of, lot of eggs here, a lot of servers. Among Us, Beaming, Factorio, Minecraft, Terraria, and a ton of other ones too. And there's actually more nested within the Steam folder. So Steam CMD folders, if we go into there, these are a whole bunch more of Steam games that launch with Steam CMD that they've already configured for us. So Arma, Seven Days to Die, Left 4 Dead, Left 4 Dead 2, Quake, Starbound, Team Fortress 2 Classic, The Forest, Tower Unite, Valheim, and more. So let's actually pick one. I'm gonna pick something totally different and I'm gonna pick Terraria. So within Terraria, this would be our nest and in here we have different eggs. So we have T-Mod Loader, T-Shock and Vanilla. Let's grab Vanilla. So what we need to do here is actually just copy this JSON right here. 
So if you see each server name is a JSON file, we go into there, we have the JSON. So let's actually copy this JSON. Let's create a new file. I'm gonna name this terraria.json. And in here, I'm gonna paste that JSON and save it. Now that we have that saved, let's actually go back to our server. And then back in our server, instead of going into servers, let's actually go into nest. So let's create a new nest. You can see the ones that we had here already. So let's create a new nest. I'm gonna name this Terraria and save it. That doesn't give us a game, that just gives us an umbrella, a nest for all of our eggs. What I usually do now, because I'm not sure what to do here, I go back to nests again, and then I say import an egg. So let's import an egg and let's find that JSON file we just created. And here's the file we created, terraria.json. And then it's gonna ask us which nest we wanna associate this egg with. So I'm gonna choose Terraria here, import, and now we have it. So now if we go into nests, we see it here and we can see our nest in our egg. Here's our egg down here. So let's create a server now for Terraria. So create new, Terraria, we name this vanilla, server owner, is me. The allocation again is the one server node we have on these ports. Then we're gonna set the memory. I'm gonna give this a gig of memory and disk space. I'm gonna give this two gigs of disk space. I don't think it needs much. Now we'll choose our new nest of Terraria, didn't spell it right, and then choose our egg, which is vanilla. And now you'll see we have some additional configuration and this comes from that JSON file. So I can set the version I want. I'm gonna set it to latest. I can, I can name the world if I'd like how many max players, the world size, difficulty, and a message of the day. But I'm not gonna set any of that. Let's create a server. Now this is installing. Let's check the panel. We can see it's pulling all of that down. So while that's going, let's go back and check on Team Fortress 2. So let's go into servers, Team Fortress 2, and go back to our panel, and it looks like that's all ready to go. And you can see my public IP address, but I'll hide that here in a little bit. But Team Fortress 2 is ready to go, so let's launch it. And I just realized, hopefully my music wasn't too loud this whole time I've been recording. I think I've been playing music in the background too, so I apologize. I don't know, I'll figure it out. Rookie hour. Anyway, so now let's join this server. Actually, let's collapse this down a little bit. Let's take it out of full screen mode. Let's go into window, run in a window. Okay, okay, okay. Just gonna make this a little bit smaller so we can see it while we play. Okay, let's go to find a game, community servers, created a server, let's connect. We can already see I connected to the server here. Cool, it also woke up from hibernation so it must stay in a low power state. It's vac secure for any cheat so this might take a second the first time you launch it. And here we go, we're connected, continue, choose blue. Sure, we can engineer. And here we go. So I'm in my server, pretty lonely. It's just me, but you get the idea. Okay, so let's stop this game. Disconnect and leave. It saw us leave, and now it says it's hibernating. Pretty awesome. And let's go back. I think Terraria should be done because that's a pretty small game. So Terraria, pop out to the console. We're up and going, so it's 27,002. The server started. Okay, so let's go into multiplayer. Join VIP, who's gonna join me. And here is my server, found my server, connected, and we are connected. Now, I can't get this into windowed mode, so <laughs> you're gonna have to trust me that it was connected. Uh, we are connected to the server. For some reason, Terraria is being weird and I can't get it into windowed mode, I think because it's an older game, so. But you can see, I I'm playing on my own server right now, and uh, yeah, this is pretty, pretty awesome. Okay, so we've connected to three different servers and things are looking really good. So I mentioned Valheim, a pretty popular game. We can spin up a Valheim server, pretty easy too. If we go back to that repo of eggs and we go to Steam CMD servers, we can see here at the bottom that we also have Valheim and we can choose either plus or vanilla. So let's choose vanilla, copy this, create a new file, Valheim, JSON, paste this JSON in here, save this. Awesome, I'm getting a CAPTCHA on my own server. Pretty awesome, I didn't mention CAPTCHA, but it does have CAPTCHA. It comes with the default CAPTCHA set uh, based on the server. I highly advise if you're gonna make this public to change that CAPTCHA. 
uh, based on your own CAPTCHA for your own account. And while I'm talking about it, I might as well show you where it is. If we go into settings and settings again, we go into advanced, here's your secret key and here's your CAPTCHA. You just have to go out to Google, get a new site key and get a new secret key, paste it here. But pretty cool, they have CAPTCHA. No idea why I didn't appear human. <laughs> well, if you've seen some of my earlier videos, I didn't appear human either. Anyways, so let's go into servers. No, let's go into nests, create new, say Valheim, Valheim or Valheim, import, choose Valheim, into Valheim, create a node, create a, create a server, new server, Valheim, write allocations, 4096, 20, 40, 8, 0, Valheim, there we go. Now I have it set. And here we have some additional configuration. Again, server name, password, app ID, whether it's dedicated or not, auto update, beta password, which branch you want on, we'll create the server because that's all good for me. The owner ID field is not set. I thought I was gonna make it through this without forgetting that, but there we go. And let's set that, create server, go to our panel or our console, and here it is being created as we speak. The other cool thing while we're in here I should talk about a little bit is you also have a file manager. You can go, well, once it's done installing, let's go into Minecraft, that's probably a better example. If we go into our servers and then say Minecraft and then go into our terminal or a console, we can see we have a file manager here and we can go and modify and edit any of these files that are here. Like this JSON file doesn't have anything here, but if we had band players and we wanted to add a band player like Techno Tim, we could, and we could ban me <laughs> from not ever joining or modify any of these files really is the important piece here. Uh, but you can explore the file system within that container and make modifications. Super, super duper cool. So you can upload, create new files or modify existing. Um, we also have some additional settings here, databases. I, I don't use this, schedules. I don't use this either. Um, users, backup, network, startup, and settings. So a lot of configuration that we can apply to these servers, which is really, really cool. And yet another reason why I wanted a system like this to be able to manage this. So that if I ever give someone else access to the server, I don't have to tell them how to use Docker commands or SSH into my servers. I can give them access to this panel and they can issue commands right here if they wanted for Minecraft to issue specific commands or any server. That's where it gets really cool. So let's check on Valheim. It looks like it's running, so awesome. It's up and running. We have some CPU usage and some memory usage, so pretty awesome. If we go back out and pop into our server itself by clicking on Pterodactyl, we get a dashboard of all of our servers here, so pretty awesome. So what do you think of Pterodactyl? Do you think it's overly complicated? Do you think it has a nice UI? Are you gonna use it? Let me know in the comments section below. And remember, if you found anything in this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. This morning I was, I was kind of thinking the same thing, like I wanna shift some stuff around. I, I usually do, like I was talking about my Chenbro case earlier, like that was my test bed for quite a few things. Um, and uh, I, I was, I had this urge to kind of shift some stuff around and you mentioned tech gig and you also men mentioned uh, bare metal true NAS. Those are the things that have been going through my head uh, the last, uh, I'd say the last two weeks. Uh, maybe, maybe I will, maybe I won't, uh, we'll see. But uh, 